On today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, uh, Nelson Peltz, the guy who's trying to wrestle control of Disney, yeah, he says Kevin Feige isn't qualified to run Marvel anymore and that he doesn't know why they have to make black and women movies. Uh, the Penguin, according to Colin Farrell, is really dark and incredibly violent. We'll talk about his comments also. Pirates of the Caribbean producer Jerry Bruckheimer has put any kind of doubt to rest. He just confirmed that the next Pirates of the Caribbean movie will indeed be a reboot. Also, Bad Boys 4 now has an official trailer as well as a full official uh, title that has come out. And Godzilla X Kong opening this week. The official first reactions have come out and they're exactly what I was kind of hoping they would be. We're going to talk about that and a whole bunch more. The John Cabe Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast, coming from right here in our quaint little studio. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio today, back from the dentist. What's right up? There, we got Jonathan Voikos here. Hey, guys. The delightful Chris Carr is here. Hey, everybody. And most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here, making the show part of your day, and here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics I just listed off. Then in the second part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. And as long as your comments or questions are appropriate to be used in our show, we will address those here just a little bit later. All right, guys. That all down. Let's jump into it here, shall we? That cuddly guy next door, Nelson Peltz. Oh, we all got a Nelson Peltz living in one of our neighborhoods. You know, big... <laughs> Bigoted, racist pieces of crap. Yelling anyway, at your kids to get off your lawn. Yeah, yelling, screaming at the clouds to get out of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. Well, for those of you who do not know, there's kind of a power struggle going on over at Disney right now. Nelson Peltz and his main guy supporting him, Ike Perlmutter, the guy who used to be Kevin Feige's boss until Kevin Feige threatened to leave Disney unless they got rid of him. Bob Iger took Kevin Feige out from under Ike Perlmutter, blah, blah. And Ike Perlmutter's been pissed about it ever since. Well, he's trying to take over some board seats on Disney. And, and really, a lot of people say he's trying to remove Bob Iger as CEO, wants to bring in his own kind of stuff. And we've got an upcoming, you know, ownership vote. A vote amongst the shareholders to see if they will grant Nelson Peltz what he wants, kick off a couple of members of the Disney board and replace them with his lackeys. And, you know, we've talked about that a, a little bit here and there. And, and listen, uh, not to take anything away from Nelson Peltz has had an incredibly successful run as a financial investor. He has. I'm not going to take that away from him. The dude, when it comes to money, he knows how to make money. He does. <coughs> that being said, in a recent comments being made by Nelson Peltz, um, he, he kind of did some really stupid things. He said some really, really dumb things. Uh, one of the things he said was, when, you know, they put to him, like Disney's been mentioning, you don't really know anything about the movie making business. He says, well, maybe I don't know how to make movies, but I don't think they know how to make movies either. Oh, got him. I'm convinced. Zing. Roast his ass. Wow. All those billion dollar films. Talk about yeah. receipts. Man, I'm sold. Receipts. Timeline. People. No idea. No idea. And as far as Kevin Feige, Feige Schmeige. That putz doesn't know what he's doing. Listen. Just to quote a little bit of what Nelson Peltz just recently said, this comes to us from the folks over at uh, CBR. When pressed if that means that Kevin Feige should be fired, Peltz added, I'm not ready to say that. Notice he didn't say no. I'm not ready to say that. Yeah, I just want to make it But I question his record. <laughs> I question Kevin Feige's record. That dude whose movies have made thirty billion dollars. Billion. I question his record. L let's just go back to this. I'm not ready to say we should fire him. I'm not saying I won't, but I'm not ready to say we will. I I'm just saying I question his record. People go to watch a movie or a show to be entertained. They don't go to get a message. I just want to know if 
if Nelson Peltz knows that almost every movie, almost every relevant movie in history has a message. The Godfather has a message. Al Pacino talks about it all the time. Citizen Kane has a message. Movies are art. Artists have things to say. It's just whether or not they're the things you want to hear. But anyway, I, I just want to go from there. They don't go to get a message. This is where his real sharp intellect comes out. Why do I have to have a Marvel? I'm not really sure what a Marvel is. But I don't need, I, uh, yeah, I'm confused about that is one he, too. Is he the mom in Arrested Development? Is he giving people money saying, go buy a Star Wars? Go yeah. buy a Star Wars, <laughs> kids. All right. Why do I have to have a Marvel that's all women? Uh, just a fact check. There is no Marvel film that has all women. Just want to point that out. Uh, not that I have anything against women. You know you're talking to a chauvinist asshole when they have to preface what they're saying. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It always makes me feel safer. Not that I have anything against I women. Feel good then. Like, yeah, anyway, you probably don't. Not that I have anything against women, but why do I have to do that? Why do I have to watch a movie with women? Guess what, dipshit? You don't. <laughs> you don't. Just shut up. <laughs> why can't I have marbles that are both Okay, 33 Marvel films, three of them have female leads. 33 Marvel films, why can't I have both? Anyway. That's three too many. That's three too many, baby. <laughs> and then he says, and why do I need an all-black cast? I know. Oh, Man. Where, where is that one? I, I don't know, because last time I checked, Bilbo saved her life by throwing himself in front of a bullet, and then at the end of the film, saved the world by taking down the bad guy black characters who are going to go and conquer the world. So I'm not quite sure what movie had an all-black <laughs> cast. But let's, I, I want to I sit here for a second and dissect this a little bit. I want to go into this brainchild nutfucker here uh, ab about some of the things that this moron has said. Um, first of all, I, I know we already mentioned it, but I got to go back to this thing. I question Kevin Feige's record. I question Kevin Feige's record. Listen, if you are one of the Disney shareholders, this should be the end of the discussion for you. Any sh Disney shareholder that votes this guy's way is a moron. We have a producer who has created the most successful film franchise in the history of Hollywood averaging nearly $1 billion per film with a $30 billion deposits against 33 movies that he's made. Nothing in Hollywood history has ever come close to that record of success. Ever. And this nipple pimple is saying, I question this guy's record? I don't, I don't know if this Kevin Feige guy knows what he's talking about. I, I, don't, I don't think... I don't think he understands the movies. Yeah, it's classic gaslighting. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and listen, I just for the record, okay, if Nelson Peltz, who I'm sure is watching this show, <laughs> were to say to me, okay, can't be a but what has Kevin Feige done for us lately? Because listen, nobody. Actually, I get complaints from people saying, John, why are you being so negative on Marvel lately? But listen, uh, nobody talks more about how this is not this. Right now, we are not in Marvel's finest stretch. We talk about it all the time and they got to get things turned around. We've talked about some things that may be behind that, but in case Peltz wants to come and say, yeah, well, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, all those billion dollar films and all the records and all the whatever, but what has Kevin Feige done lately? All right. Okay. Let's, let's look at lately. Let's just go back a couple of years. Let's just take a second, take opinions out of it. And look at these little pesky things called facts. Ugh, that's too hard to do. It's, yeah, like, <laughs> that's no fun. Critical Looking at facts rough. isn't fun. Let's just look at the last couple of years. And as critical as I have been of Marvel's performance the last couple of years, you still have to give credit where it's due. And let's take a look at some facts. And let's let's do so we can put it in context, just for the sake of context. Let's hold it up against their nearest competitor, DC. All right, just, just for some comparison, just so we can have context, all right? If we go back starting at the beginning of 2022, Marvel has put out six films. Doctor Strange 2, Black Panther 2, Guardians 3, Thor 4, Ant-Man 3, and The Marvels. Six films. Now, 
by contrast and comparison, DC has put out five films since the beginning of 2021. Aquaman 2, Blue Beetle, The Flash, Shazam 2, and Black Adam. Now, Wait, did you say Black Adam? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pelts. Because Pelts, Pelts may have a problem a with that. <laughs> Wait, why do I got to have that? So Black Adam, okay? So uh, Marvel had six, DC had five. All right. How did they perform? And and again, we're all, we're not trying to put this up say look how bad DC is. No, no, just for just for context. We're just holding them both up for context. So how did they perform? All right. Well, since 2022 began, here's what DC films results have been. Aquaman Fire. 2 made 434 million dollars. Blue Beetle made 128. These are worldwide numbers by the way. Blue Beetle made 128 million. The Flash made 266 million. Shazam 2 made 132 million and Black Adam, sorry Pelts, made $390 million. Now that's a grand total of $1.35 billion. But if just, just to compare apples and apples, that means on average, the films that DC has put out since the beginning of 2022 have averaged $270 million per film. Okay? Now, we just set that up as a plateau. Just say, here's, here's what we're going to compare against. Here's our context. What has Marvel done since the beginning of 2022? Well, their films have had the following results. Doctor Strange 2 made 952 million. Black Panther 2 made 853 million. Guardians 3 made 845 million. Thor 4 made 760 million. Ant-Man 3 uh, made 463 million dollars and the Marvel and the Marvels I should say made 200 million dollars. I want to point out that four of the six films they've put out since the beginning of 2022 have made over $750 million. $750 million. Four of the films they put out since 2021, or since the beginning of 2022, have made over $750 million. In total, since the beginning of 2022, Marvel's films have made $4.07 billion and have had an average of $678 million per film. Well, you know, I think I, I'm seeing a pattern here. If we're looking at these numbers, yeah. Ant-Man 3 had two women in it. The Marvels had three. Now, that's, <laughs> now, now follow me, follow me. That's Slippery five, slope. That's five women. I don't and, like this version well, of Well, now math. math is math. At a cost of $100 million per female, you reach <laughs> $200 million from Thor's for 760. So that's the problem, obviously. I'm Ellie, you're not taking into account all the women that are in Black Panther too. Well, no, well. this is convenient math. But convenient. again, yeah. for context, DC Films, the other major comic book movie production outfit since tw the beginning of 2022, $270 million per film. Marvel, in their weakest state that they've ever been in, you may or may not agree with me when I say that, but it's it's what I think when I look at the... Uh, well, I get in the weakest state that Marvel's ever been in and in the weakest stretch that Marvel has ever had, whereas they're making competitors average $270 million per film, Marvel films in this weak state and in this weak stretch are averaging $678 million per film with four of those films being over $750 million. And by the way, in case Nelson's interested, Let's talk about these women movies. Out of 33 films, Marvel has had three female-led films. All right? They had Black Widow, Captain Marvel, and The Marvels, making $379 million, $1.13 billion, and $200 million. On average, if you average that out, the women films have averaged $570 million per film. Let's talk about the black lead led films. Out of 33 films that Marvel has produced, 33, two of them have had black leads. Or as Peltz would say, two too many. <laughs> two of them have had black leads. All right? Okay. Why do I need to have that? Nelson Peltz says. Well, what did those movies do? Black Panther 1 made $1.35 billion. Black Panther 2 made $859 million. They average $1.1 billion per film. Oh, and by the way, won three Academy Awards nominated for five, including Marvel's first Best Picture nomination. Well, ah, why'd we got to make that one? why we got to make... Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, they've only made two out of 33. And by the way, those two average $1.1 billion. 
Now, you can have whatever opinions you want about all those films and which ones are good and which ones are bad, and that's those are all fair discussions to have. But the numbers are the numbers. The facts are the facts. And when you've got a dick zit coming out and saying, I question Kevin Feige's yeah, these are getting better and track better. record. <laughs> I question I question Kevin Feige's track. If you are a Disney investor, immediately your alarms should be going off. The flag should be going up and you go like, this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Because this guy who he questions his record has made us more money than any other, than Walt Disney himself has made us. It's absolutely preposterous. And, and, and listen, I'm sorry, it's okay to have opinions and this, that, and the other thing. But at the end of the day, Nelson Peltz is that shriveled up bag of shit racist bigot who just lives next door that is constantly calling the cops because you're mowing your lawn too loud. It's an embarrassment. <laughs> I said earlier, basically Nelson Peltz is that old city councilor in Parks and Rec. That's what, it, that's, there he is. Just so you know, that's not Nelson Peltz. No. But it kind of is. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. And listen, you can be a Disney shareholder and maybe not like the direction the company's going in. That's fair. You can be a Disney shareholder and think, hey, listen, I kind of question our leadership right now. That's fair as well. That's all totally fair. But if your other option is this guy who says, I don't think they know how to make movies. I question Kevin Feige's record. I apparently don't know numbers. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a joke. Anyway, uh, Chris... Uh, you've sat very patiently as I've gone on my thing here. Uh, what what do you think about uh, Nelson Peltz's comments? I mean, he seems really reasonable to me. He seems really just, reasonable. No. Wouldn't it be wild if that's what I came out the gate with? Of like, no, he's right. <laughs> he's he right. makes you know, a good point. He brings up some excellent points here. It, it's giving a lot of, I can't hate women. I have a mother. Or, <laughs> I have a mom. How can I hate Or women? somebody who brings up that they have a black friend when they talk about like, but also voting is weird, isn't it? Like, <laughs> I don't love where a lot of these things are coming from, and neither does Disney. The uh, actual Disney folks have clapped back pretty hard. They released a statement talking about how his ideas are the things that are going to keep things from happening, right? Mm. This could be the worst thing because he's also suggesting that they have this whole board reviewed way of approaching media now. Yeah. So yeah. that he wants to put 40 to more them. cooks in the kitchen for the creatives. Exactly. Yeah. And Disney came out and said, the thing that's going to impede us the most is having an 81 year old hedge fund manager with no creative experience telling us what we can creatively do. Yeah. And to come for somebody, I've not loved the last few Marvel movies, right? And I've made. I think they've never be been no weaker than they are right now. Sure. I, I think they're in their worst state that they've ever been in right now. But to say that the person who's made you $30 billion is not the right fit is interesting to me. <laughs> Just, well, then who do you want, buddy? Because you're putting yourself up for the job and I don't know what you've seen. The idea of, well, they don't know how to make movies and I don't know how to make movies, so why don't I just give it a go is so asinine to me. It seems like such a ridiculous thing to say. So, uh, I mean, I don't understand how a person said the quiet part out loud. That's really the big thing here <laughs> of like, just let everybody loud. let you know that you're racist and misogynistic. Um, let me see if I can find one of these other quotes here. By the way, I just want to point out, mm -hmm. I was just searching. I was looking for Nelson Peltz's, uh, Nelson Peltz's expressed outrage when Avengers came out and had an all white cast. And I, I couldn't find, I couldn't find his, uh, his objections. Well, exactly. I couldn't and find you, his complaint. You can't have it both ways, right? I can't say, well, Avengers is an all male cast. Cause someone is going to say, no, it's not. No, yeah. it's not. There's Scarlet. And yeah, Black you know, in there. you see, you see Maria Hill in there. There yeah. are women in there. How dare you? Yeah. Like you don't get it both ways. You don't get to be, to borrow a phrase, cafeteria Catholic, right? Where you pick and choose what your belief system is. Yeah. You have to look at the facts here. I'm just gonna tell you an anecdote because it's giving me this. Growing up in Texas, I had a neighbor who's very, very Southern and delightful, yeah. but also incredibly conservative. And she went on a trip to New York and she was gonna go see the Lion King. When I asked her out what, she said, oh, I mean, it was good, but it was so African. <laughs> it's a, it's a story, 
about a lion the lions in Africa. in Africa. And that's what a lot of these things are giving me right now. Our movies can't have messages. Every single one does. Hot Tub Time Machine has a has message. Has a message. It absolutely does. Yeah. Get over that. We can't have women-led films. Okay, well, you have only had a handful and the Three others out of 30. did fine, right? Not all of your male-led films have done well. We can't have an all-black cast. Well, you haven't. You haven't had one yet. So I just feel like this is somebody who is using their own personal political or or personal agenda to make movies that are, quote, not woke, which good job, Grandpa, for using that terminology. Oh, That's the best way to sneak in so is modern. use the words. But it <laughs> feels like somebody is using woke in place of, as usual, saying, I don't like opinions, people, or genders that are different than mine. Mm -hmm. They scare me, and I don't want it on my screens. Have you seen Seinfeld? Yeah. Okay. You know who Nelson Peltz is? There's an episode of Seinfeld, for those of you who might remember this. I kind of want to say he's the suit Nazi, but wedding, it's two on the nose. <laughs> where Jerry's at a wedding, and he's with his date. Uh huh. And it's the episode where he, he gets into it, Brian Cranston's dentist character. Yeah. He's making jokes about dentists, and he's with his date. And they're, they're putting down dentists, and like, they're like, what do you call somebody who, flop, who flunked out of med school? What, a dentist? Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, screw dentists. And then, then so Jerry and his date laugh, yeah, screw dentists. And then the date, just as the, before the credits roll, the date goes, and don't even get me going on the blacks and the Jews. <laughs> That's Nelson Peltz. That's Nelson Damn. Peltz. Nelson Peltz is Jerry's date at that wedding. Damn. Yeah, that, love, that's Nelson Peltz. I love that mouth. you said Soup Nazi. <laughs> soup Nazi actually had a skill set, though. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes. I actually have a quote because you were talking about a quote. It reminds me of people like this. It, mm -hmm. It's from Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. The trouble ain't that there's too many fools, but that lightning ain't distributed right. Ooh. <laughs> that's a great line. Well done. Anyway, guys, question <laughs> is, what do you think? Kevin Feige, you know, he doesn't have a very good track record, apparently. Uh, we've been told by a guy who knows nothing about movies. Uh, what do you think about the comments? Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? Speaking of Marvel's most direct competitor, DC, they're, of course, going through a bit of a Mothra-like metamorphosis. Uh, as we speak, getting ready for James Gunn's new Superman, but they've already got kind of their Elseworld stuff going as you know, we've got the Joker coming out. Well, we had the first Joker. We got the second Joker coming up. Matt Reeves' Batman is phenomenal. And one of the best things in that Batman movie was Colin Farrell's Penguin. So good. And finally it's coming out. Now we've heard quotes in recent weeks saying that this is going to kind of be an edgy kind of R rated kind of show and stuff like that. Well, Colin Farrell himself has now come out and put some context to it, saying this thing's going to be like extremely dark and, what is it, incredibly violent. This comes to us from the folks over at Deadline who wrote the following. While promoting Apple TV Plus's Sugar, which, by the way, looks really good, uh, the actor revealed that he has just wrapped filming on the first season of Penguin and stuck a fork in it weeks two weeks ago. It was a long and really wonderful experience, Farrell said in an interview with MovieZine. It's dark. That's what I can tell you about it. It's really dark. It's really heavy. I think it certainly was doing it, which is not to say that I didn't have fun. I had an amazing time doing it, but it's incredibly violent. This, I don't want to hear this in all my comic book fare. Like, I don't want to hear, I don't want to go into like, I don't know, a new X-Men movie in here. It's incredibly dark. It's so violent. It's so heavy. I don't want to hear that. Like, yeah, I want there to be some great comic book violence. I want some heavier topics, but I also want it to be fun and whatever. But when I saw the trailer for Penguin that they dropped just recently, I'm like, this feels more like instead of a comic book property with a little bit of realism put in there, this feels like The Godfather or Casino or Sopranos with a little bit of comic book isms thrown in there. And it's exactly what I want, especially coming out of Matt Reeves's The Batman, where they he really painted a very gritty and very grounded world with his interpretation of Batman, which I, I thought was fantastic. And to get like a look inside, the true inside of Gotham's crime underbelly, and to have it be that dark and that heavy and that violent and all the stuff that the trailer seemed to promise us, that they're going to deliver to us, it looks utterly fantastic. And I love hearing what we're hearing 
coming out of it. You know, I said this before, Chris, I can't remember if you were here for this or not, but I said, you remember that Fox show Gotham? Yeah. I said, when, when they showed us the trailer for Penguin, I said, this is what Gotham should have been. I, that's why I always Instead thought- Instead of just building towards Jim having a mustache? Yeah, Jim having a mustache and, oh, look, it's everybody, that kid's going to be Batman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought this is what it should have been. Anyway, Chris- you saw the trailer for mm-hmm. Penguin. You're reading these comments from Colin, Colin Farrell. What's your take on this? I've been hyped about this for so long. And I'm just getting more and more excited about this being here. Because he, to me, far and away, was the best part of the Batman. I loved him so much in that. And I was not expecting that performance. I was not expecting to like him so much. I kept cracking jokes about, you know, they just made him look like mean Richard Kind. Why are we doing this? <laughs> and then I had to eat crow because he was incredible as the penguin. And much like you, I enjoy the idea of looking into Gotham's underbelly because, I mean, everyone said this multiple times, Gotham's another character, right? Yeah. And to have that exploration and go through how the actual low level, mid level, all of those different criminal tiers work is really interesting to me because we spend a lot of time focusing on the big families, the heads, right? The Falcons and everything like that. But most of our time is spent with the kind of denizens of Arkham Asylum. Right. I'm really interested to see the regular Joe Schmoes who are committing crime in Gotham who have these aspirations and how they operate within this world. And this world makes sense for that exploration since we aren't doing fantastical stuff in there yet, right? We don't have a poison ivy who has plant powers. We haven't had a clay face who, you know, is able to manipulate their body and face and everything. We don't have a Mr. Freeze yet. I think this show is going to do a really wonderful job of just yes anding the mm. Batman. Yeah, I like and that. I'm really pumped to see it. He is having just a killer set a few years too, Colin. He is such a phenomenal actor and it's really really exciting to see him just really blossom like this all right with that down guys uh but but by the way do by all means let us know what are you thinking about the show has it been appealing to you are you looking forward to maybe you want it to be a little bit more comic booky Uh, I kind of like the fact that it's just going really crime world kind of feeling but whatever you guys think jump into the comments and let us know your thoughts All right, guys, with that down, let's move on to this, shall we? At some point, we've all known there's going to be another Pirates of the Caribbean movie, right? We know that. The question that there has been is, will it be one with Johnny Depp again? Now, that's been something that Hope has been kind of kept alive by with some comments made by some of the producers suggesting that maybe there's still a chance they could do it with Johnny Depp and all that kind of stuff. Now, that is all before the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard drama, I mean, it was very, very clear that Disney kind of didn't want to work with Johnny Depp anymore before the Amber Heard drama. There's all the stuff about, you know, the the way he conducted himself and the fact that they couldn't get media stuff out of him and he was constantly on something and, and things like that. Look, I'm not saying they were right to feel the way they did, but that's how Disney felt at the time. And I remember back in the movie talk days, we were talking about how Disney was kind of thinking about parting ways with him. But even though they have declining box office, even the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie made money, right? Maybe they had declining box office, but they were still making money. And so a lot of people still kind of believe that maybe there's a chance because some of the producers kind of floated that maybe there was a chance that we could see another Pirates of the Caribbean movie with one of the greatest, most iconic on-screen characters of all time, Captain Jack Sparrow. Well... The producer of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, Jerry Bruckheimer, iconic Hollywood producer. It sounds like he just put the final nail in that coffin that ain't going to happen. This comes from the folks at IGN who wrote the following. The producer, that's Jerry Bruckheimer, hinted that Pirates of the Caribbean has a better chance of returning to the big screen first because they are planning on rebooting the franchise, which makes it logistically more straightforward to work out a schedule. Bruckheimer said, you don't know. You really don't know. Buckheimer said initially when he said, because with Top Gun, you have an actor, obviously Tom Cruise, who is iconic and brilliant. And how many movies does he have to make before he does another Top Gun? Can't tell you, but we're going to reboot Pirates. So that is easier to put together because you don't have to wait for certain actors. So nothing super insightful or whatever about that. They're probably going to make another Pirates. There's probably some money to be made, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's kind of key in here that it seems like Jerry Bruckheimer himself has now kind of closed that door 
about it being a continuation of the previous pirates about maybe <laughs> sir for those of you listening to the audio podcast sorry uh, one of our one of our viewers mb dyson wrote i question jerry bruckheimer's record nelson peltz um that was funny uh, but but basically, uh, Bruckheimer saying and, and and kind of putting it to bed, they're moving forward. He's going to do a reboot of the thing. Now, whether or not the reboot ends up being the best Pirates ever, the worst Pirates ever, who knows? But Chris, it's interesting to hear that he's saying that because uh, some of the people involved with the Pirates franchise have kind of been never saying that they're going to still have Captain Jack Sparrow, never saying that Johnny Depp will return, but kind of just hinting little things keeping some hope alive for some people that maybe it'll happen. But it, it looks like Jerry Bruckheimer herself has kind of closed the door on that. Right move, wrong move. Do you think maybe there is still a chance that Captain Jack could return? Or does this definitively close the door on that? You know, it's it's really hard to say because I just, I don't know about you guys, I so associate this franchise with Captain Jack Sparrow. When Yeah, you can almost change it from Pirates of the Caribbean to the Captain Jack Sparrow movie. Exactly. Right? Right? Everyone here is fabulous. I love their relationship. Oh my gosh, come on, Barbosa. Wonderful, wonderful. But it really does kind of hang on Jack, right? And so I'm not sure if that's the move. It feels like something you should maybe completely reboot, ju re reboot just because of how Disney's relationship has deteriorated with Johnny Depp, um, how the public, there's various camps on how they feel about Johnny Depp too. We have some people who are very pro him. He was wronged. Other people who are still on Team Amber Heard. It really is just a mess with that whole relationship um, and how it's bled into their personal lives and everything and how it's affected studios and films being made. I just don't know. I feel like Pirates to me, for some reason, still feel so fresh mm. and recent. And I know that's not the case. <laughs> I know that's not. Yeah, Orlando Bloom has a grown ass son in the last one, right? Yeah. So. It feels like it's the right amount of time to do a complete reboot over it and have somebody else take on that type of Jack Sparrow role or explore it in some other way. But when we have kind of deviated from the formula, the movies haven't done particularly well. He's been in all of them. But when we've gone to, hey, there's a Mervane now, or hey, now we're dealing with, you know, the kids and, and how that's all working out for them. And he's still present. Those stories have kind of leaned off. I feel like when we've had it be basic treasure height, you've got Will Turner in there, you've got Elizabeth Swan in there, you've got Captain Jack Sparrow. Those are the movies that people gravitated towards. And I think there has to be some kind of reinvention of the wheel with those three characters. And I don't think it's as easy as say, rebooting and re-exploring with new children the harry potter series mm, that one right, you have yeah, to really yeah. win people over but it doesn't make sense to have daniel radcliffe play a 10 year old again this is one where it's but he's be there kind of funny, though. You know, i would watch it i'm not gonna lie i'd be <laughs> like let's see how this pans out i want to see him be like never <laughs> i'll never join you um but i feel like this is such a, a iconic character that it's going to take a lot of reworking and a lot of changing of people's minds of what the franchise is supposed to be that's uh, a really wishy-washy way of saying, I don't know. Yeah. Ray, what was the release date for the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie? Oh, that's sick. It's like, back uh, there. Black, it goes bl back. Black Pearl. I mean, it, go it goes back. I mean, yeah. we're talking about old friend. Here's one of my problems with the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. I might have mentioned this before years ago, but one of the things that drove me crazy about the Pirates franchise as it progressed was that when the first one came out, and this is kind of like a little They're jump. Saying 03. Like, yeah, what's that? 03. So 21 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. So That's there was kind of a John now. Wickism here. When Captain Jack was first introduced to us in that first Pirates of the Caribbean movie, which to me is still the best one they did, you had kind of the, you know, to, to kind of a jokerism, he was the clown prince of the sea, right? But make no mistake about it, he was a fearsome pirate, right? Captain Jack was a name known, and people knew you do not trifle with Captain Jack. Yes, he was. He had his. Um, oh, who's the guitarist uh, for for Rolling Stones again? Oh, uh, Keith Richards. Keith Richards, yeah. right? But he had his Keith Richards isms, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, he was a fearsome pirate, not to be trifled with. As the movies progressed, he became more Jar Jar Binks where whenever he did succeed at something, it was ass backwards accidentally. Like it's, they it's turned a drunk him, Kung Fu master kind of feel. Yeah, yeah. So by the by the time we got to the final one, which I, by the way, I didn't mind the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie as a matter of fact, but by the time you get to the final one, 
the fearsome not to be trifled with pirate Captain Jack that we were introduced in the first one was gone and he was just kind of a buffoon. He, he was just a clown, not the clown prince of the sea, but just a clown who was a lovable clown, clown but was really nothing formidable about him. Where in the first couple, there were. And I kind of wish that they had stuck with that kind of a of a Captain Jack as they progressed. But I do know. hope going forward, they don't have to put too many pirates in this movie, though. <laughs> <laughs> this all pirate cast. Yeah. I, Nobody I wants a pirate though, message. A in lot the of movie. his a lot of his buffoonery. And this is probably me reading too much into the movie. I, he's a severe alcoholic. I just kept being like, yeah, I mean, he's a massive alcoholic. That liver, that's just, that that's poor he's liver. deteriorating. You guys not sharp. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? Uh, I mean, Jerry Bruckheimer, the producer of those movies, is now saying he's going to reboot it. But maybe you think there is still another chance that we could see Captain Jack, one of the most iconic Hollywood characters ever, return. Whatever you guys think, jump in the comments below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? There was a big missed opportunity calling Bad Boys 3 Bad Boys Forever because that would have been a, a great title for the fourth film. But the third Bad Boys, I'm not going to lie to you, my favorite of the Bad Boys franchise. And again, I, I like the first two Bad Boys, but I've never understood the, the big, huge cult following that it has. Like there, Some people have a real passion for those first two. I like them. I'm, I'm, I'm pro Bad Boys 1 and 2, but I didn't love them on the level, let's say, a number of other people did. Three came out, and I really had a great time with three. I had a blast with three, and it was honestly my favorite of the bunch. So clearly, looking forward to number four. Well, the official trailer and title for number four just came out, and the official title is Bad Boys Ride or Die. Seems original. You know what? No, I, you know what? It, it fits. I think that is a title that fits with kind of the naming conventions they've had so far, and when you understand the whole nature of the bad boys and stuff like that, I kind of liked it. And as far as the trailer goes, I thought it was pretty fun. I thought it was, I, when he goes in to get the hot dog, when did he put these hot dogs on? Yesterday. Fine. <laughs> like, I, 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 I get dug it. It had that same, listen, these two guys, I can't even remember, what Ray, another date to look up. When did the first Bad Boys come out? I just had that up, right? Yeah, when was the first Bad Boys come out? Because Martin Lawrence and Will Smith have been making these movies it's easily been over 20 years. I, I did. I mean, did it come out in the 90s? 95? 95? Yeah. We're talking 30 years. Next year, it'll be 30 years that these guys have been riding together in these movies. And you know what? Watching that trailer, to me, it's like they have not lost a step. They still have that great chemistry together. They still play off each other great. I love the energy the two of them have together. Was it... A magnificent trailer? No. But for a Bad Boys trailer, I, I thought it looked pretty fun and and signed me up. Now, of course, th that brings us to the elephant in the room. And, Ray, maybe you can pull up the box office for yes. the uh, most recent Bad Boys, Bad Boys uh, for Life. The elephant in the room is going to be, are audiences ready to go back to the theaters to see Will Smith again? That's That's going to be... The question, I think, for a lot of people going in. What yeah. was the box office? You want really? the opening or the... No, the, the worldwide total. total. 426. 426. Hey, that's more than Black Adam. That's more than Black Adam. Opening was an impressive 62 million. Yeah, I remember it had a really good, strong, solid opening weekend. Again, it's my favorite of the bunch, so not bad. Now, will are people wanting to go back and see Will Smith again? I can only speak for myself that I am. You know, I've, I've talked about this before. I was as put off and disgusted by what Will Smith did... It was like the act of a coward. It was completely bullshit because again, if John Cena had been the guy up on stage making jokes instead of, you know, five foot seven buck 20 soaking wet Chris Rock, I don't think Will Smith goes up on stage and slaps him. <laughs> that being said, that being said, um, it was what it was. He didn't murder anybody. He didn't slap him, then throw him to the ground, get full mount and start dropping elbows on him. It was what it was. He has paid, Will Smith has paid, I've said this many times, he has paid a huge price with being globally humiliated for years. He's lost out on tens of millions of dollars in projects and endorsements and all that kind of stuff. He's paid a huge price. And at some point, I think 
you know what? I'll only speak for myself. At some point, I myself just feel that I got to be ready to say he's paid the price. Let's move on now. And with bad boys, I don't know how other people are going to feel. I'm ready to move on and see what he can do with bad boys for. Not everybody's going to feel that way. Anyway, Chris, um, a couple things here. The title of the film, do you like it? Do you not like it? Um, the trailer itself, are you ready to go see Bad Boys 4? I don't know. What did you think about it? Well, I have to watch Bad Boys 1 through 3 first, as you recall. <laughs> that, but uh, I, I thought will, that would be coming. <laughs> I will say, though, this is a good trailer. And it, it promised me the kind of movie that Andy and Hot Fuzz promises me. <laughs> and that's all I want from these. It seems fun. It seems bombastic. And I'm genuinely excited to binge all of these and, and watch it in theaters. I think it's going to be a good time. The story makes sense, right? The, the police captain that they've been working with seems like he's been you know framed. There's a lot of intrigue and, and stuff happening there. They've got to go right those wrongs. Title's fine. They definitely missed a trick by jumping the gun on what? They were going to call this because of that bad boys for life would have been fabulous. Just here. perfect. It would have yep. been so good. But this looks fun. It looks fun, and and I'll probably see it. And I'm with you. I I'm ready to see Will Smith in something. That sucked. What happened? Sucked. It sucked. Yeah, there's no way around it. it, it and was, it was not BS. the correct thing to do. Should Chris Rock have also doubled down on some things that he knew about and made jokes about them still? No, but you never hit somebody. We established this in preschool, yeah. right? And I do agree that he's paid those dues. Again, as I've brought up many times, so many other people in Hollywood have done so many more egregious things and have immediately gotten cast in notable things again. Yeah. So I feel like this is this is the right time for him to come back. It's the right franchise. And Bad Boys has also, it's about at $840 uh, million collectively as a franchise mm. and so so this one should put it over they the should put it mark. over a billion so it can join ghostbusters in the franchise bringing up that much money and i think that's a very feasible thing for these guys to do and it looks fun you may you made a good point when you said this is the franchise to do it because this isn't a franchise where you recast will smith in it yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> of course he's going to be in bad boys 4 so you're either going to go as a bad boys and will smith fan or you're not or you're not this isn't like some other tent pole where it's like, why did you have to go with Will Smith? You know? Right. It's it's kind of the the issue that he had and he kept apologizing for with mm -hmm. emancipation of you are not ready to see me in a film. You are not ready to root for me. You are not ready for me to be the hero in a film. You you don't want me to succeed right now because of my actions. And that sucks that I've put everyone who made this beautiful film in that position because yeah. of my inability to control myself. Right. I think he's done a good apology tour. Whether or not you think it was all PR or not, regardless, it was done well. It was executed well. He was already a bad boy. Let him come back. <laughs> he's already a bad boy. <laughs> Question is for you guys. What do you think? Did you like the trailer? Do you like the title? Are you personally ready to go back and see Will Smith on the screen again? I am, but that doesn't mean you have to be. Whatever you guys think, jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. <clears throat> With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? I don't know if you heard, there's a Godzilla King Kong movie coming out, and it's coming out wow. this week, Godzilla X Kong. This time, they're aiming and got their sights on the World Tag Team Championships. Mm. They're going to be the new Heart Foundation, the new Killer Bees, the new, what did the... Uh, the Natural Disasters. The man. Natural Disasters. The Legion of Doom. The new Rougeos. Who are, you're, who, go, you're going, I'm going way deep lower cut. than... I'm going you're deep, go, deep You're cut. going in reverse. <laughs> we started at the top. You're going lower and the lower The new lower. Barry Windham Microtundo. The new Killer Bees. <laughs> I already said Killer Bees. Oh, you did? I did. He doesn't oh. listen. B, Brian Blair, Jumpin' Jim Brunzel. That's these two right behind me. That's what they're going for. If they come out, man, it's a missed opportunity. If they, in the final fight of the movie, they don't come out in wrestling trunks, I'm going to be very disappointed. Anyway, the movie comes out this week. I think you're going to be disappointed that. <laughs> That's going to take I a civilization up to sew those together. <laughs> so, I, listen, I am not expecting Shakespeare here. I am not expecting a top 10 greatest movie of the year. But, but hopefully it'll deliver what the last one did for me, which was fun. It's, it, give me some fun. You give me some fun, I'll be good. Now, listen, the first reactions have now come out. <laughs> they came out last night, and they're exactly what I expected and exactly what I hoped for. The general theme we're going to read here in a lot of these reactions coming out theater is kind of light on story. <laughs> right. Not, not the best narrative, if you will, but 
a lot of giant monster action, which I think is what a lot of people are looking for. Anyway, let's read through some of these. These come to us from The Hollywood Reporter. Michael Lee writes, Godzilla X Kong is a noisy titan brawl with hardly any human heart to engage us on an emotional level. But audiences coming for the fights alone are getting a supremely awesome tag team match between Godzilla and Kong versus Scar King and Shimo? Hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm probably not. Uh, King, by the way, there's an Asian international trailer that just dropped last night for Godzilla X Kong that shows us for the first time our first really good look at Shimo and Mothra and it shows like the four of them flying at each other getting ready to fight it looks pretty good if you want to look that up all right next we got Aaron who wrote Godzilla X Kong hits plenty of sweet spots for me tons of wild kaiju action a brutal villain for Kong a powered up Godzilla Dan Stevens having a blast some legit surprises and so many colors bring me more monsterverse yes. uh, we also got Ian Sandwell who writes Godzilla X Kong the new empire is the most enjoyable monsterverse movie yet uh, the one where it feels everybody understood the assignment story is a bit thin but the Titan smashing more than makes up for it Hashtag Godzilla X Kong. Uh, we move on to Andrew J. Salazar, who writes, Godzilla X Kong, the new empire rules. Director Adam Wingard fully embraces the tone of the fantasy rock opera, complete with a synth-heavy score, heavy metal visuals, and killer 80s needle drops. Incredibly silly and heartfelt at times, it's a sincere love letter to the Showa era. Next up, we got Beans, who writes, Godzilla X Kong is nonstop, Full kaiju action that fans of monster movies love. Both Godzilla and Kong take center stage in this latest entry in Legendary's Evolving Monsterverse. Brian Tyree Henry and Dan Stevens are fun together. I heard that a lot, that the two of them have really good chemistry together on screen. But this movie belongs to the giant monsters. Heroes Unbound says Godzilla X Kong is an absurdly fun ride, a teeming of titans with tremendous scale and a fast-paced adventure. The movie knows to deliver pure fun on a huge scale. My advice, just strap in and enjoy the ride. So, And, and this basically goes on. A lot of platitudes about, this isn't winning any Oscars, but it's a, it's a theme park ride. It's a lot of fun. Look, one of the big criticisms, if not the biggest criticism, of the first MonsterVerse movie with Godzilla that came out, I think, 2014, 2015, the one with Bryan Cranston was, hey, it's a movie called Godzilla with hardly any Godzilla. And ooh, the monsters are about to fight and cut away to an apartment in uh, New Jersey. (laughs) You know, it sounds like they have learned the lesson of that, and it sounds like Adam Wingard was like, You want to see giant titans beating the crap out of each other? Strap in. That's what we're going to do. So, you know, I got invited to a press screening tonight to go see just a little bit early. But I I don't accept press screening invites anymore, so I'm not going. But we're going to go see it on Thursday. Yep. We got our tickets on Thursday. Too bad it's not 4DX, (laughs) baby. No, but we got uh, we got the Prime, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, we do. We got the uh, the AMC Prime, which is great. So seeing that or in IMAX would be great. Nice. Uh, But listen, this is exactly where I thought it would be, what I thought the reactions were going, to be, were going to be was story is light, action's good. But where it exceeds my expectations is it sounds like people had a lot more fun with the action than I was anticipating. And Ray, I, I know out of everybody in this room, <laughs> if we had to pick the person who's most excited about Godzilla X Kong, it would be you. How are you feeling about the reactions? Were, were the getting? reactions like hit, hit it where I wanted it to be. Like exactly the way I want it is uh, they're describing. I mean, it's a popcorn flick. I, 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 I think all of these should be pop- popcorn flicks. I think with my minus one coming out, with that human story it gave us, I think a lot of people may have expected maybe it going on the same rails as that. Right. But no, this is always supposed to be a fun popcorn flick movie, for, you know, that we enjoy talk about for the rest of the week. And then move on to the next thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's, it's, it's probably not what we're going to be talking about for the next no, few no, years. No, no, no. It's going it's to be a big thing for like the week that it comes out. And then we're going to move on and can't wait to see the next one. But yeah, th- this last trailer that you showed me, I, I, I don't know what message this movie has. <laughs> we were talking about all the movies have messages. All I know is I cannot wait to see this destruction. I cannot wait to see them team up. This is like maybe one of my top movies this year I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. And by the way, I don't think this, even from the sounds of the first reactions, 
it sounds like a movie that not all the critics are going to totally dig. So I'm expecting maybe a 65 percent yeah, Rotten Tomatoes rate. Like it's 60. Well, I guess it's just reading from the reactions that we're getting here. But here's an interesting note, and I kind of alluded to this the other day, with all these positive reactions coming out. Godzilla X Kong is releasing in March. If it comes out where it's projected 45 to 55 million opening weekend, which if the word of mouth is good, maybe it might even be bigger than that. But if it does get 45 to 55 million, Chris, it will be the fourth film this month to open to over $45 million. Damn. Dune did it. Kung Fu Panda did it. Uh, 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 Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire just did it. And now if Godzilla X Kong can do it, it'll be four movies in the month that opened over $45 million, which would be great. Anyway, That's Chris. Exciting. Where has your expectation level been for Godzilla X Kong? And, and, are these reactions where you thought they would be? Are they better than they th you thought they'd be? What are you thinking? I, I love Kaiju. I'm Team Ray on this. I love the Kaiju so much. <laughs> and I think we got, honestly, a little spoiled by Minus One because that's such a great human story yeah. with Godzilla in it. And usually all I need is Kaiju wrecking fools. I see them wrecking <laughs> shop. That's all I need. That's all I need. And sometimes with the other Godzilla movies or things, they spent too much time on the people and I just didn't care. I just didn't care. Mm. Monarch balanced this out well, and then Godzilla minus one might balance this out. For this one, hearing that the action is so fun, that it's really great, that you are just enthralled with what's going on, that's all I need from this. Mm. I just need monsters fighting monsters, maybe monsters teaming up to battle worse monsters. <laughs> I, I, that's all I want. I just want to There's the whole shot, by the way. This is the shot from that new trailer where we get our first good look at the other dragon lizard thing that looks significantly... He looks like he's got a good 200 pounds on Godzilla. It looked like there. that move that Logan Paul and Ricochet will do at each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also, I was saying it reminds me of that shot in in the trailer for Spider-Man No Way Home yeah. where all the heroes and villains really? are oh, yeah. why, did, why did Lizard's head just cock to the yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Also, better news, it's only an hour, 55 minutes. So it's hey. under two hours. We're hitting a little bit below two hours, so. Good That's your you. street spot. That's where Ray likes it to be. Yeah. Uh, I Listen, I'm not going to lie to you. I... I said before that I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not necessarily excited about it. <clears throat> I think I've gone over the the uh, precipice here. I, I think I am now officially excited about watching this on Thursday. Cannot so wait. yeah, I cannot wait. It's gonna be a lot of fun. A lot of popcorn coming up. Anyway, guys, <laughs> question is for you. What do you think about the reactions we're reading coming of Godzilla X Kong? Or maybe you were hoping to hear like, look, okay, good action, great, but give us a great story too. It does sound like maybe it's a little bit thin on that. Does that turn you off? Or are you just more excited about it because it sounds like they do actually deliver a good heapings of giant monster kaiju action? Whatever you guys feel about this, jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, we're going to get on to the most important part of the show now, which is hearing from you guys and taking your live comments and questions. But before we do, we're going to take a quick moment here and thank the sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at Miracle Made. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Miracle Made. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. When they arrived at our house, my wife Anne loved the feel of them so much, she couldn't even wait for me to get home to put them on our bed. Miracle Made has self cleaning. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent prevents up to 99.7 of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. Miracle sheets also have incredible comfort and quality. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. So go to TryMiracle, that's T-R-Y-M-I-R-A-C-L-E dot com slash Campia to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code CAMPIA at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA and use the code CAMPIA to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA to treat yourself and thank you to our friends at miracle made for sponsoring today's episode of the john campus show podcast 
All right, guys, with that down, let's get on to your questions here, shall we? Chris, what do we got up first? Uh, Matt Boyle. From Matt Boyle, has anyone checked on Josh McGawa after that Makuga. bad boy? That would be a Makuga, yeah. That Josh is a trailer. guy we used to work with and he is a major bad boys fan. Oh, okay. Major, major, Makuga, yes. Yeah. Big, hardcore. Like, I think what Star Wars is to me is probably what bad boys is to. Oh, uh, he loves oh, damn. oh yeah. All right, what's next? From Anello, am I the only one that thinks Rise and Dawn of Planet of the Apes should have swapped names? Oh no, that no, no, that's been the topic of articles. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They absolutely hundred percent. I mean, we talked, we used to talk about that a lot. There have literally been like a number of articles written what, when those movies are coming out about how they could, should have swapped out the titles. Hundred percent. You're not alone in that. All right, what's next? From Suthius, Fuji's now my favorite. Her subtle expressions during certain situations are hilarious. Didn't expect this show to have much humor, but very natural. Now, I I, I think Fuji is the is John Blackthorne's concubine. I think that's that's who it is. I think that's who it is in in the show. In Shogun, and, yeah, in Shogun. Uh, if show, if so, I'm assuming. If <laughs> I'm assuming we're not talking about. Mr. Fuji, the legendary <laughs> WWF uh, tag team manager. Well, he comes back to wrestling. Oh, he comes back to that. Um, but yeah, she is. Uh, sorry, not co- Bruce Lum in the live chat has corrected me. Has correctly corrected me. Not his concubine, his consort. Uh, very, very different things at the time. Yeah, she's great in it. This I saw the new episode last night. This show just continue. Listen, if they keep it going. I think this Shogun is about to pass Last of Us and wow. House of the Dragon is, I think, the best show of the last five years. It's not Dang. there yet. It's got to stick the landing, but man, the new episode was freaking awesome. All right, what's next? From Christopher Brickner, Norman Osborn is considered Spider-Man's greatest enemy and is usually the main villain of Spider-Man media. So it's weird for me to learn he was dead in comics for 23 years and not used from 1973 to 96. That's right. I always think of Auk as his... A lot of people, yeah, especially to, especially since Spider-Man 2, the movie. Yeah, right? well, and also uh, the uh, Superior Spider-Man run was so interesting of just having Octavius in Peter's that, body. Yeah, but, and also because during this period he just mentioned, Ock mm-hmm. had been yeah. there, you know? But, and listen, the new run they've got going on where he's like in his 30s, Peter's in his 30s and has never been Spider-Man and has just found out he was supposed to be Spider-Man this whole time. That whole story has been really, really interesting, too. Mm-hmm. All right, what's next? From William Roush. Hi, John. I just watched one of your favorite movies, Highlander. Who wants to live forever? And I uh, thought it was really fun. I know the second movie is one of the worst of all time, but are there any other sequels worth watching? Nope. <laughs> They're not all as offensively horrible as Highlander 2. As a matter of fact, Highlander 3 came out. I think Mario Van Peebles was in that one. Anyway... Highlander 3 came out and it basically <laughs> just pretended that Highlander 2 never happened. So in in my head canon, Mar- Highlander 3 is really the sequel to the first Highlander. But in all honesty, none of them are as bad. None of what came after were as bad as truly one of the worst films ever made, Highlander 2. But none of them are ones you got to watch either. It's called Highlander, <laughs> The Final Dimension. Uh, that was the name of the third one? Yep. With Mario I didn't, even, I didn't even remember the name of it. I will say this, though. There was a television series of The Highlander with Adrian... What, oh, I can't remember what the actor's name is. Adrian something or other. Adrian Paul. Adrian mm-hmm. Paul, thank you. Highlander The Source. Uh, but Okay, but that was one of the movies, not the TV show. Oh. So the TV show The Highlander with Adrian Paul wasn't great, but it it was worth watching. It that one was actually yeah. pretty good. He plays Connor McCloud's cousin, Duncan, Duncan McCloud. So it's it's supposed to share the same cinematic universe. Anyway, that one's not bad. But really, now nah, watch the first one and then you're good. <laughs> you're good. Just leave it at that. All right. What's next? From T.J. Perry, AMC Scream Unseen equals Killer Spider movie Sting. Way better better than it had any right to be. Really leans into the camp and the jokes landed. Thumbs up. I gave up on AMC's Screen Unseen uh, right right from the beginning. Like they, <clears throat> I think for these Screen Unseen things to work, whether it's you know the Regal one or the AMC one, not every time, absolutely not every time, but once in a while, you got to really thrill the audience to make them think that you could be seeing 
the next big movie, right? Like that the last one they did, that it's possible the one you're going in to see is the new Godzilla X Kong. Right. Or the new Deadpool. I mean, we're ways away from that one, but you know what I'm saying? Instead, I think the one AMC did recently was the re-release of Labyrinth. It's hmm. like, really? I came to Screen Unseen to watch a re-release of an older movie? I, I And so every time they've done it, it's kind of been lower key movies that, frankly, we could have waited for. Again, I'm not saying every time they do it, it needs to be some big banger. But maybe one out of every four to at least plant the seed that maybe, just maybe, we hmm. might see when we go to this secret screening that it might be some big, huge movie we've been all desperately waiting to see. They got to do that every once in a while or else people like me lose interest in it. And I'm no longer interested in the AMC screen. And you can, scene. you can pretty much predict it. Some deductive reasoning, you can just kind of figure out what this well, is. Well, yeah, because be. they list the rating yeah, and, yeah. and the runtime. Yep. So you can kind of figure it out. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't, I don't know why I'm mentioning this, but speaking of that maybe, just maybe there's a chance. Ann and I started a uh, tradition, I guess you can call it, that we're not lotto people like at all, but we decided when the lotto gets over $1 billion, we'll buy a couple of tickets. So tonight's drawing, the California millions, it's $1.1 billion, which means tomorrow all y'all suckers ain't going to see me because I'm going to be buying my new boat. That's right. Ann and I bought two tickets. <laughs> Two tickets. You're definitely going to win it. We're definitely going to win. I'm already spending the money. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm already spending it. Don't worry about it, honey. Just got from one, a number one standpoint, the coming. odds are definitely in your favor. Two tickets? <laughs> Doubled our chances. Dang, double. yeah. yeah. Doubled wow. our chances. So, yes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's true. Buying a lottery is an idiot tax. 100% it is. But once it gets over a billion dollars, both Anna and I were like, well, we'll pay the idiot tax. <laughs> let's let's see how it turns out. <laughs> so if I come in tomorrow, or if I don't show don't up tomorrow, show up. Well. <laughs> I'm out there. I'm uh. either out there living up my 1.1 billion, or running from the creditors because I've already started spending the money. <laughs> it might be the latter. Otherwise, I'm a asking bit for a nice yeah. severance package. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. What's next? Uh, from. Uh, Alex Van Gollum. Hi, y'all. About Shogun, Taranga is the Japanese Vito Corleone. He's outmaneuvering all his opponents. He's awesome. It's a greatly written show. First of all, the book, he's a greatly written character in the book. Uh, and, and the show is deviating a decent amount from the book. I mean, it's, it, the, the bones are all still there. Uh, Hiroyuki Sonata is, he just is Lord Toranaga. Toranaga-sama. It, it's just so good. There's a speech in the new show where saying, I've never wanted to be Shogun, and it's just it's just a great speech. Um, the the maneuvering, the intrigue, the oh man, oh man, the old rulers, the mother of the old ruler's son, she is a shit disturber of the highest level, and she dangerous. Oh my god, this show's so good. Every week they make another character like fascinating and incredible, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, every day I wake up wanting to watch one of my favorite shows where one woman is trying to convince another female character to have a threesome. Uh, like Shogun has it all. Sounds Just like when too you many think women to given me. You everything they Sounds give like too you many more. women to me. Pretty female led. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> female led. I don't like that. <sighs> all right, what's next? Give me too much power to the women on that one. <laughs> From Damaris Love, Pelts and Perlmutter are dipsticks. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, Ike Perlmutter. I mean, look, we talked about Ike Perlmutter for years. Everybody talked about it. But yeah, that that little nugget in the toilet that keeps circling the bowl, he's still around. That dude's still around. And yeah. All right. What's next? <laughs> From Matan, sending in a $15 super chat. Do you think that Zelda and Minecraft movies limit themselves by being live action instead of animated? Animation could open more opportunities. Yeah. No. I, I, I think... I think doing something live action from from something like that. I mean, look, there are properties like Mario. Mario clearly belongs in an animated world. I mean, that Mario himself is like such an animation character. You can't do a live action thing of Mario justice. Like they tried it with the great Bob Hoskins and 
that didn't work. I mean, that, that, that just didn't work at all. That being said, um, something like Link and Zelda, I think it would have been stupid to do that one animated. I think I think you have an opportunity here with a live action iteration of this because you know some games will just really lend themselves more to be live action, and I think a a Legend of Zelda, uh, a Link movie is one that they should be doing live action. I'm glad that they are. And because it has its potential upside exceeds the potential upside of it if it was animated. There are other video game properties that absolutely more lend themselves to being animated. 100%. Like Mario. And look at the success that had. But I think something like Link. Minecraft, I don't know what the hell they're doing. I don't know how you make a movie out of Minecraft. But whatever. I didn't know how they could make a movie out of Lego. And look how that turned out. Not bad. So we'll see. We'll see. All right. What's next? From Raymond. True. Justin Lin helming uh, Spidey 4. Spider-Mobile? I don't believe... there. there there's a rumor going around that Justin Lin may direct Spider-Man 4. I love rumors. <laughs> and um, I don't... <laughs> listen, uh, let me put it this way. <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe the report. But if it does turn out to be true, I'm good with it. I, I wouldn't mind that. I think it'd be pretty cool. Look, what John Watts has done with the Spider-Man films is incredible. You know what? Nobody gives John Watts his, his credit. He has directed three fantastic Spider-Man movies. I mean, I don't think they're the best Spider-Man movies. Into the Spider-Verse, Across the Spider-Verse, Spider-Man 2. I think those are all... But, but, I mean, he has taken those three films, Homecoming, Far From Home, No Way Home, and made three bangers, huge success, and he still doesn't get his due. John Watts still doesn't get his credit, uh, but he's done a great job with that. But if Justin Lin can come and do it, I'm all for that too. All right, what's next? From James Germain. So I saw Blazing Saddles for the first time. Woo! Y'all want to get on RDJ's case for Tropic Thunder while this exists? <laughs> LOL, keep it filthy. I, I, I'm i telling you what, Blazing Saddles. I, I often talk about the single funniest moments in all of movies. And my favorite is still Spaceballs, Rick Moranis. Now Lone Star, you'll see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb. <laughs> and the way he says it, the timing of it is so perfect. I've never laughed harder. But up there in the top two or three is in Blazing Saddles. When the dude stands up to cause a distraction, says, hey, where are the white women at? It is one of the most side-splittingly, the timing of it is impeccable. It is one of the single funniest moments ever in cinema. Uh, I mean, Mel Brooks... The dudes, I just, yeah, it just dawned on me. Yeah, but they're both Mel Brooks moments, the ones I just mentioned. Mel Brooks slays, man. He absolutely slays. And you got to watch. Listen, if you've never watched them, treat yourself. Do a little double header of Blazing Saddles and the original Airplane. Do a double feature. It will be an afternoon well spent, my friends, if you do. All right, what's next? From HV3, I agree that Frozen Empire started off a bit slow, but in the end, I loved it. Not only do I hope that they make another, I hope they make three to four, five more. Yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm glad you feel that way. I, I thought the, the, the first two acts were not just slow. I just thought they were poor. I, I, I thought the movie was falling on its face for the first two acts. None of the jokes landed for me. The over-reliance on nostalgia was kind of sickening to me. The third act picked up. You know, business got real in the third act, and the jokes started to land... The, the nostalgia uses were a little bit more on point. Uh, it started to have more fun to it. And the third act honestly saved the movie for me. So I walked out of Ghostbusters Frozen Empire going, you know what? In a thumbs up or thumbs down world, it's a oh, thumbs up for me. Ghostbusters. Not, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like with your big G. No, 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 no. No, no. Ghostbusters. Because like I thought this whole time I was like. You're talking about Frozen? No, I thought he, he was talking about Godzilla X-Kong. Frozen Empire? Empire? Oh, New Empire. <laughs> So I was like, wait, what is he talking about? Okay, Ghostbusters also has Empire in the name. I see you had your thinking cap on, so. <laughs> Start off slow. Yeah, um, I, I the, the problem is I just don't see where it goes. Like, it, at the end of the day, it was just another Ghostbusters movie. Same thing. Now there's a new ancient evil that we, for some reason, never talked about that could end the world. I, I don't know. So, well, you know, we'll see. It had a great <laughs> opening weekend, though. Had a great $45 million oh, opening weekend. Oh, yep, nice. had a really good opening weekend, so we'll see. All right, what's next? From Mr. I, had a heart attack on Saturday. I won't miss your show. Well, I you got your what? priorities straight. 
Mr. I, I, I hope this is being facetious, but if not, man, I mean, we hope you're doing better. Yeah. Well, let me one-up you. Did you panic because you thought we had a show, or is this or, a true heart it, attack? Yeah. Like, what? Yeah, heart attack's no fun. I've had two. Uh, now, I, I got lucky that they were both on the same day. I had two heart attacks on the same day, like one, like 35 minutes apart from each other. Very efficient. Two times. Yeah, what? Two times. <laughs> um, it just doesn't work for certain. <laughs> two times. I couldn't, I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it, man. Oh, um, yeah, yeah I mean, it yeah. was, it, it, like, I was, uh, I was literally training Muay Thai with former UFC fighter James Sandman Irvin when, when I had my first heart attack. It was not and not a lot of fun. Uh, so, but, but, no, but. No, Mr. I did literally have a heart attack. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, gosh. That, so, I mean, that sucks. But, I mean, if you got treatment quick and they were on the ball, uh, you can, I, I'm very lucky. I, I was able to make a full recovery. My cardiologist said, you are 100%. You're probably better off than you were before. And, Go get them, Tiger. So you will get to that point as well, hopefully. As yeah. long as just listen to your doctors, do all the things you want they tell you to do. And we're glad you're part of our show, man. All right. Oh my gosh. What's next? I hope you're on the mend. Uh, we have another one from Mr. I. As per Jay Schneider, Fast and Furious director Justin Lin to direct Spider Man 4, guess there will be more family in it. Again, I, I don't think I believe it. I, I don't think I believe it. But it is possible that it may be true. And again, if it is true, I'll be for it. All right. What's next? From Andy, one of two. No joke. The film Late Night with Devil, uh, with Late the devil. Night with the Devil, brought in six 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 on Sunday, which was also Palm Sunday, the first day of the Holy Week, when Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem before the crucifixion. Well, well, well. Yeah. See, here's here's the thing, though. This is what everybody in the industry knows. It's no joke. That is the reported box office. It's not really the box office. <laughs> It's, it's not really the number that really came in, but that's the number they're reporting and it works. They're like, just add another six. It'll be funny. It works. I mean, I'm sure the real number is extremely close to that, but yeah, it's, it's not actually that number. All right. What's next? From Guzman. I'm not an Iger lover, but pelts can get bent. Yeah. Again, that's look, it, there's nothing wrong. If I, I think if you're a Disney shareholder and this is, I tried to bring up this point earlier, there is nothing wrong if you're not happy with the direction of the company. There's nothing wrong if you think, hey, our leadership could use a little bit of a shaking up. But you don't get the crazy guy next door to be the one to come in and do it. You want to change up the board a little bit? Change it up. But don't put that fucking ass hat or any of his lemmings on it. Don't give that guy any control. I question Kevin Feige's record. The, the, why do I need to watch a black cast? The movie's made $1.1 billion each, man. We won three Academy Awards. What are you talking about? Doesn't matter. Like, you want, you're want you not happy with it? That's cool. Make some changes. Do some things to make some changes. But it's like, you know what it's like? It's like saying, I don't like these pants. What's my only alternative? I'll just walk around with my dick out all day. Yeah, that's, that's, that's reasonable, right? John, why you can't be walking around with your dick out? Yeah, but I didn't like my pants. Then put on different fucking pants. Like... If you don't like the current leadership, that's totally cool. But you don't put this guy on it, and you don't give this guy any control over it. You could have thought of a and, better example. <laughs> well, I'm not wearing. That's, that's what the people at home don't know. I'm not wearing any pants right now. They just don't realize it. If anyone uh, wants to give us more super chats so we could afford an HR, <laughs> that would be a red letter day for me. For some comfortable pants. A red letter day. All right. What's next? From Andy again, one of two once again. In X-Men 97, Gambit and Rogue are dating, but they can't touch because Rogue's powers would kill Gambit if they do. However, her ex, Magneto, is invulnerable to invulnerable to Rogue's powers, so she can touch him. I'm thinking, wait, I've seen a similar story before in another show. Didn't think I'd see this story again. Will Gambit and Rogue become swingers? LOL. By the way, uh, Magneto is not invulnerable to the powers of Rogue, but Magneto has something he can do to protect himself. He creates a microscopic magnetic field around himself so he can touch Rogue and it feels like they're touching, but they're not actually touching. His superpower is that he is the magnum. Yeah, yeah. he is the full body condom. Yeah. For right? Rogue's pleasure. Yeah. Ultra thin. <laughs> ultra, ultra thin for ultra satisfaction. Magneto. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... It's uh, 
it's it's great. I mean, I I I love that in the X Men uh, Age of Apocalypse storyline, which is why they hook up and they have a kid. Like uh, Magneto and Rogue have a kid in the Age of Apocalypse storyline as well, and um, it's going to be really neat seeing them how they do a little love triangle in the show. All right, what's next? From Angel, hi guys, what's your favorite team movie? Thanks. Like hockey team, sports team, team or team movie? Team, team or team? team up, team with an M. T E A M. Oh, team. team movie, Team America, baby. Basketball. I don't know. Team Poli- Police Academy. Ooh. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Police pretty Academy's good. great. <clears throat> but they were they? Oh yeah, they were. I was talking about Mystery Men. Um, I, I mean, yeah, you got to narrow down the phrase the team, team a little bit, I think. The very first was uh, Mighty Ducks for me. Mm. For sure. Really? Where, like, I, I, I had that sense of, oh, this is a team. We have to do it together, this and that. And you were at the right age for that. Movie, oh, so. then then you know what? That comes, uh, going back to when I was a kid, John Candy's Cool Running. <gasps> cool Running there was go. great. There yeah. you go. See? There's one. That was another completely <laughs> black cast, including John Candy. <laughs> Nelson Peltz Mel- had Nelson Peltz nothing to do with that. Up, yeah. All right, what's next? From Kevin, sending an A twenty dollars super chat. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Please make Spider Man four ground level. There is an argument to be made, you know, and Rob brings this up a lot, and I agree with him that what we have not seen, we have not seen the traditional Spider Man yet in this new uh, MCU Spider Man. Right? We've had Iron Man Junior, and we've had him traveling to Germany and and fighting universal global threats. But what Rob points out once in a while, and I agree, is that we have yet to see the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. We saw a glimpse of it. The ATM robbery, Yep, right? they gave us a glimpse of it. But to have a movie that's actually more on that level... Mm. Um, they could do that. I think would be... Yeah, I, I think that would be really fun if they could do that. What they need and... to do is explore the cosmic power Spider-Man run, and he goes off and fights Arsham. And then Rob will finally be what, happy. What ground are you on? <laughs> Listen, but in reality, though, there's been a lot of stuff in the comics lately where the comics have been implying a lot more lately that Spider-Man has always undersold his actual power. Mm. That Spider-Man, as it turns out, all this time, Spider-Man has just been pulling his punches. And there was this one, I can't remember what the story was, where, because, you know, he's had these epic battles with Kingpin, but there's this thing, there's this one storyline where... Uh, he gets pissed off at Kingpin and decides he's not pulling his punches anymore. I think I think it's it, Kingpin ends up killing Aunt May or something like that. Mm. And it's not close. He just goes and beats Kingpin to death. Right? Just beats the living shit out of him. And like Kingpin's got the top of like, has he been holding back this whole time? It's like, but so they've been doing that a lot. That Spider-Man is a lot more powerful than they've been showing. So it depends on which way they want to go in the movies, but I would love to see a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man movie. That would be cool. All right, what's next? Oh, uh, there we go. From our members. From, oh, here we go. DJ Infa Desert Eagle International. <laughs> <laughs> One of two. We often <laughs> criticize things when they're in development because we don't see or know the end result. Is part two in here? Oh, there we go. Uh, given the nature of the MCU, Tony, don't you think Iron Man Jr. made sense and it was just a part of his development? And now we have Spider Man. No. <laughs> Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> no. Womp, womp. Spider-Man. Look, you don't have to do things the way the comic did them. I, I've always preached that, right? Y- your job is to make the best stuff possible. Yeah. But they fundamentally made Spider-Man not Spider-Man, right? When you've got Spider-Man coming out of the gate and he's wearing an Iron Man suit and he's using powers, and he's got the AI and his little visual things and his like, because the message was Spider-Man isn't cool enough. Spider-Man isn't powerful enough. He's not cool enough. The the kiddies like Iron Man suits. And one of the things the MCU's done in recent years that really has driven me crazy, is everybody has Iron Man suits now, right? So like even even the Dormelage have Iron Man suits now. Like everybody gets an Iron Man suit. Yeah, but that's not why that movie failed. We know why. No, yeah, yeah. Failed $852 yeah. million. Dollars. Um and so I've always thought that was a mistake. I mean, don't get me wrong. I I am saying that, but I love home homecoming and Far From Home and No Way Home. I love those movies. I really do. I love Tom Holland as it. I just really wish they let him be Spider-Man instead of Iron Man Jr. And, you know, they're, every traditional Spider-Man story is him becoming Spider-Man by learning his way and and by working his way to that rather than, I don't know, rather than what they did. Again, in many ways it worked, but I just wish they had done it differently. All right, what's next? 
from Walter Whitewalker. Success of the Acolyte will depend solely on who they cast as Farouk and Bradshaw. <laughs> that only people who are old school wrestling fans will remotely understand that I reference. Say, I was like, why? Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Undertaker, who is now retired, one of the most iconic wrestlers of all time. They, he, he went through some gimmick changes here and there, but for a while there, Undertaker had his acolytes. Zach, let me see it. The, and and they, it was Bradshaw and Farouk were his, uh, or uh, Simmons. What was Simmons' first Ron name? Simmons. Ron Simmons. Ron Simmons and, um, and uh, Bradshaw. Yeah. And they went, and then they went from being Undertaker's acolytes to being the APA the Acolyte Protection Agency, where there would be bodyguards. And then they just did some crazy stuff anyway. Anyway, I'm way over explaining that. Let's move on. What's next? From, okay. Yes, I we think did it's this. all DJ, so. Yeah, it's still all DJ? Oh, okay. DJ Infa, Desert Eagle, Inter No, Desert we're not doing that well, every most, time. Each time. <laughs> well, most of us don't agree. Can you see why Disney thought Eternals was the best film they had made in the MCU? It's not just the tone. I could see how when that film was coming together, that they felt that because listen, Rob and I both really like that film. I, I like it more every time I see it, but I don't think it's anywhere near the best Marvel film. Uh, I mean, I, I think personally, I think they were way off on that, but I could see why, because it was such a different movie from what all the other Marvel films had been. They really went more with, with the drama, the character arcs and stuff like that. They played way more into that. It was definitely a Zhao movie. Uh, more than a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. So I could see as it's coming together and Kevin Feige, who started to get a taste of like Oscars, not just billion dollar films, but Oscars, was looking at what was coming together and feeling like maybe this is the best thing we've ever done. I don't think it got there for them, but but I thought it was a very solid movie. I might not like it quite as much as Rob does, but I, I still thought it was quite good. It's a gorgeous film, for sure. It's a beautiful film. Costume-wise, just atmosphere-wise. Yep. It, it was very calm, serene. Performances were yeah. great. It, it was a really, really good film. And I get it. There, there are people who just want to go to Marvel films, and there's nothing wrong with this, who just want to go see the explosions. And it's it's a little bit more of a grown-up film than, than a lot of their other fare. And it wasn't what I think a lot of people are used to. But, yeah, the more I watch it, uh, the more and more I appreciate it. And um, I, I think it's really quite a good movie. All right, what's next? From more of DJ, uh, Marvel is brilliant at paying attention to detail. In every scene in Endgame, Thor's eyes are a different color to tie into Infinity War. In Love and Thunder, they are back to being the same color. Must have been fixed with the power of thunder. I honestly never noticed that myself. No? I, I've never heard that. I've never noticed that. I'll, something I'll have to look to next time I watch the film. He's gone through some eye changes, especially when one of them, he was missing one. <laughs> actually, one got popped out. <laughs> All right, well, that, what's that, next? That's why one was a different color. Right. He had that bionic like eye, right? right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, until it got restored. Mm -hmm. It's all because of Rocket, too. All because of Rocket. Come on, man. From which one are we on now? Uh, um, let's see. This one up this top. One right here. Okay, thank you. Still, DJ. I like to think that in another universe, Ben as Bats was successful, and Damon got into born shape to play Oliver Queen. Could be. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. All right. What's DJ. next? Also, DJ, thank you for all of those uh, donations. You're awesome. Um, from uh, right Seconds from Disaster. Have you seen Zathra with Dax Shepard and Kristen Stewart? It's a fun little Jumanji in space type movie. That's exactly what that movie is. Uh, Rom probably had Rob probably has it on 4K or something. I think I remember. I forgot this. about that movie. It's, Jumanji yeah. in space. Yeah. It's little. It's little like baby the, Josh Hutcherson. I think is it too. Yeah. Oh my God! I think I remember, but why oh, can't I remember? I, uh, yeah, okay. I, I can barely that. remember the film, but I, I remember that it cover. sounds yeah, very it's, familiar. It's Jumanji, but space. Okay, that's all. <laughs> all right, what's next? From Zachary, hey guys, sorry I'm late to this topic, but I disagree that Jimmy Kimmel was a good Oscar host this year. He wasn't terrible, but a lot of his jokes were lazy, and some didn't sit right with me. If your gauge about whether you like a comedian is that the joke doesn't sit right with you then you're going to be very limited on the comedians you listen to. I love, I, listen, I am, I do not like TV personalities hosting the Oscars. I've been very clear about that for over a decade. I would rather see movie personalities hosting the biggest night of the movies. It, it just makes sense to me. I, I think that makes more sense. That said, uh, while you're, point of view is no more and no less valid than mine 
it is a very different point of view than mine. I, I actually got to give credit where it's due. I thought, I thought he did a really good job. Uh, it was the pace was good. He kept the show moving. Um, he felt more like an MC than it was. So sometimes an Oscar host would come on and it's like they you can tell they look at it. It's, it's their show tonight with all the awards being given out. Kimmel never came off as this is his show. It felt like he's just the MC. He's the master of ceremonies. He kept it going. I thought the jokes were good. Thought it landed really right. I mean, again, no comedian stuff is going to be for everybody. And again, your opinion is no less valid than mine, but it is very different than mine. I, I thought he did quite a good job. All right, what's next? Uh, this was the part two to DJs. Oh, both are trained by Raz Al Ghul and have to double team have to double team him in a fight like Cap and Bucky phrasing versus Tony. <laughs> oh well. Phrasing. For a second, I was like, how did we get my fan fiction out here? What? <laughs> All right, what's next? <laughs> From Chubbs GPT. Uh, sending in a $50? I think it's or is a, that a conversion another, yeah. thing? Why Tatology, why T'Challa gotta be black? Black Widow wasn't. Yeah, it's true. Nelson, black Bolt, get out of here. Black Bolt wasn't. No. Huh? Huh? Mm. Oh, but you know what? Black Widow was a woman. Yeah. Yeah, double disqualification yeah. right there. Yeah, forget All it. All right, what's next? From DJ Infant Desert Eagle International. My dad believes Garfield is the Spidey because is the Spidey because he's the best actor. Looking at his body of work outside the tights, he's the best, but I'm not sure if it's that simple. Thoughts? It's not that simple. I do believe yeah. out of the three, uh Toby Maguire, uh Tom Holland, and Andrew Garfield. Uh, yeah, I believe Andrew Garfield is the best actor. He's a multi-time Academy Award nominated actor. Yep. Um he is a remarkable performer. He is simply fantastic. But that alone doesn't mean he's the best Spider-Man, right? It's 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 a combination of story, fit to the character, what do they bring out for the character, and all that kind of stuff. Now, for me personally, Andrew Garfield does happen to also be my favorite of the Spider-Man. I love all three of them. Love Toby, love Tom, love Andrew, love them all. Uh, but Andrew is my personal favorite. But... I, I think there's a very good, strong argument to be made for Tobey Maguire. I think there's a very good, strong argument to be made for Tom Holland. It's not just about which one is the best actor, period. There's also the matter of fit, how they manifested their particular versions of Peter Parker, how that all came across. So, yeah, it's not as simple as just who's the best actor. Um, but I happen to agree with your dad that I think he's the best one, too. All right. What's next? From Temple, D.C., as a studio, what gives you more prestige, box office or Oscar nominations? Prestige? Uh, prestige Oscar Oscars. nominations. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because by many accounts, A24 is like nothing. They're nothing, but they win a lot of Oscars. <laughs> they're getting a lot of Oscar attention these days, and that's why they're on everybody's radar now. So, look, what would you rather be? A billionaire studio or a barely getting by studio with five Oscars? You'd rather be the billions and billions dollar studio. Yeah, for sure. But if, if you're just talking about what gives you the more prestige, Oscar nominations is what does that. Because, the listen, these are still all old movie guys. I mean, that's what they want. They want to, they want the money, yes, but they also want that the thing that they can hold over their uh, their peers. All right, what's An next? An elite would be both. Yeah, and <laughs> ideal, you get both. From Dylan's Dialogue, hi there, John. Just wanted to say thank you for all you do. You're a big inspiration for myself. Oh, thank you. And the day that you retire will be a sad day indeed. Not that it's anytime soon. Yeah, no, I, but like we're still a little ways off. I am preparing. Like I'm, I'm getting all my ducks in a row, getting ready for when I get to retire. Uh, probably somewhere, sometime in 2025. Like maybe the end of 2025. Who knows? Maybe I'll even stretch into the beginning of 2026. We'll see how I, I'll reevaluate after Superman comes out. I was gonna say, let's see how exciting this DCU becomes. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's gonna be. It's gonna. Be, it's it like <laughs> I'm. I was. I was actually chatting with James Gunn on on his thing and I said listen I I please make this thing great because I am literally holding off my retirement to see Superman so please be great but anyway thank you so much for being here and being a part of our little community and uh, letting me be a part of your day it's an awesome honor thank you all right what's next from Temple DC hey John and crew the famous with great power comes great responsibility is originally from Superman 1978 Jarrell's words to Kal-El as his pod travels to Earth. I find it strange that everyone credits Spider-Man as the originators of the phrase. Okay, now listen, this is one of these things. It might be a Mandela effect. This might be one of these things I'm wrong about, but I'm almost certain that was in the comics long before 1978. Yeah. With great power comes great responsibility. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Again, maybe it's a Mandela effect thing. Maybe 
I didn't, but I am, I think I'm certain that it was said in the comic books long before that. But it was first said via Voltaire. So <laughs> yeah, well, there, okay. there, there is that. <laughs> There's that game. We were reinventing that. the wheel here. <laughs> All right. Well, anybody in the live chat knows the answer to that it can actually quote a time that it was first said in a Spider-Man thing. 1962. Oh, there you go. So long before it was in Superman, long before it was in Superman. All right. What's next? From Joe Howland. Hey, John and crew, how's it going? Do you think they may show you guys Alien Romulus at Cinecon this year? CinemaCon this year. Thanks for bringing on the filthy. That is definitely the kind of movie they would show us. What's the release date, Ray, for uh, Alien Romulus? Um, because here's the thing. They have confirmed three screenings. Obviously, they're going to show us 10, 15 minutes of, a, of tons of movies. But they have confirmed three full screenings with a rumored fourth one coming. And as of right now, we only know what one of them is going to be. And that's Fall Guy with Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt. We know we're getting that one. But the other two and possibly three, we don't know what they are. What, what... Expected, uh August 16th. So it's three months away from, from CinemaCon. So that might be a little far out. But Alien Romulus is the kind of movie... That they would do. Rob is still convinced they're going to show us Deadpool. I think he's wrong, but I deep down I'm hoping he's right. But uh, Alien Romulus, that that is the kind of movie that or would fit Rob. the bill. We'll find out. All right, what's next? Uh, here we go. From Sean, hey John and crew, I've been watching your show for four years now. Keep up the good work. Oh, thank Fellow you, man. I appreciate Edgar. that very much. So you have not, like only been on board since it's been the John Campy show, not back in my movie talk days. Thank you so much. Good to have you here, man. What's next? From Brandon, hey John and crew. So is Marvel teasing at Spider-Man X-Men crossover or team up in the future? Because in the first episode, clearly we see a Daily Bugle newspaper fly across our screens. Well, well that oh, exists in the, in the Marvel that doesn't, universe. That doesn't mean anything. They all inhabit yeah. the same universe, right? So it, it could just be just a fun little Easter egg. We as comic book fans, and I've been guilty of this too, we read way too much into stuff. Uh, way too much. Into, so I know, I, I don't think, but listen, Everything in the MCU always crosses over, whether it's in standalone movies or eventually in Avengers movies. They all always do. So at some point, you're going to see a Spider-Man in a movie where X-Men are there, too. I mean, that's obviously going to happen. But as far as something specific, I wouldn't read into anything just because the Daily Bugle was there. All right. What's next? From Jota Works, the never-ending story is getting a reboot by Oscar-winning production company Seesaw Films. Thoughts on the original, and do you think the nostalgia lives on enough for this to get a big launch? The nostalgia, no. A solid marketing campaign, yes. It's not a movie that's going to be buoyed just on its nostalgia factor. It's not one of those. I love the original never-ending story. With the Treyu, the Nothing, Falcor, the Luck Dragon. Um, I, I love the original one. I, there was a sequel, right? Oh yes. yeah. Yeah. I didn't like that one at all. I didn't I think like the sequel. three of them. If I'm, it's kind of like the Highlander that way. Didn't, didn't like, but <laughs> the first at one, at least in this one though, it's never ending. They the felt never a little more story. There is three. direct to video as the third yeah. yeah. went on. Yeah. I, but the, that first one is great. And I, it is one of those movies that I think would really do well with modern technology there's you can bring it to life a little bit better than they could before because they were limited by their technology so it's going to be really neat to see all right what's next from kane carnage x if chris is on today hi can we ask her about jack black's foreign royalties as a voice actor okay so here's here's the topic that was brought up okay and i'm glad they they just reintroduced it so jack black is of course the voice of poe yeah. in kung fu panda 4 a funny thing just happened where he went to China to promote the launching of the movie, but he's not actually in the movie because a Chinese actor does the voice of Poe uh, in China. So yeah. they, he was joking about the fact that he's there promoting a movie that he's actually not even in there. As a voice actor, would he still get... You don't get royalties for a movie. Like if, if he had points in his contract and stuff like that, and if there are residuals to come, would he get credit for the Chinese release of the movie and the money that movie makes if he's not even in it. Not as an actor, no. As, no. as a producer or other things like that, sure. But it's the other actor who is making that money is my understanding of it. That um, makes he'll sense. He'll be getting all that tasty, tasty U.S. box office. Got it. Okay, good to know. I think. All right, what's next? 
All right, from Cutoff Robin, over under 70% chance Mario Movie 2 makes more money than the first Mario Movie. I'll go under 20%. Ooh. Under 20. It, it won't make the same amount that the first one did. It, it'll be successful. It'll make big money, but it won't. I don't think the second one will be a billion dollar film. I mean, look, the reality is Mario was, was good. The Mario movie is quite good. It wasn't one of the best films of the year. It's it's not. So I, th- I actually think the Mario movie, while I predicted it would be the biggest film of the year, I actually think it overperformed. And I think the sequel can be huge. And it's, I'm not saying 0% chance it can't beat it, but I would set the realistic number somewhere around 20%. Yeah, I, I still think every day we get more Mario fans, like new Mario fans, no, just because of the kids and the, the babies all around. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's so. true. And especially if they have Luigi's, if they, if they get another Luigi's Haunted Mansion game out, I mean, that could help it a lot yeah. too. All right, what's next? From Emmanuel, seems like the IATSE strike is coming. Do you think the industry can take another strike like this? No, and I don't think they will go on strike. I, mm. I I think they will get it settled. I mean, well, don't get me wrong. I think the members of IATSE are firm that they will strike. Mm-hmm. But I don't. Th- I think the studios know they cannot because if IATSE goes on strike, that's it. Like when the writers went on strike, everything kept going. Right? They, the movies that were in production still went, were in production. Television shows that were in production, production kept rolling on up to a point. IATSE goes on strike, you're done. You're done. Nothing. You can't shoot anything if I, IOTC goes on strike. And I think the studios know they cannot afford this. They can't. And so, and it's not like they're miles apart on a number of things like some of the, they, like they were with yeah. some of the they're other They're not unions. fighting AI. They're not fighting royalty. Well, you know they are I mean? fighting AI in some, like some areas well, of IOTC they are. Yeah. But I mean, you know. But, not not for their likeness. Or yeah, the, n- nothing the like that, yeah. right? And so very unique from the actors' strike sure. situation. Also, one of our larger IATSE groups, too, because, right, they're all over everywhere. Um, IATSE 600, I believe it was about five days ago in The Hollywood Reporter, they said that that specific cinematographer's group had met all of their yes. things and they have a tentative agreement. So probably a lot of people are going to follow suit. Yeah, I. it's just that, again, it's because... I think they have the willpower to go on strike, absolutely, but I think the studios know they're going to have to meet more than halfway with IOTSE to make sure because they cannot handle another strike right now. So I believe they'll get it resolved. I don't know that as a fact. I'm just saying I believe they'll get it resolved because they have to. All right, what's next? From Armando. Hi, Can't Be a Crew. Any predictions on when we could expect more Fantastic Four news? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Mm, No. I mean, it, it should be going into production later this year, right? <laughs> so, I, but I mean, what is there left to know? That I mean, might be it for the year. <laughs> it, it, it might be it. Now, the big thing we still have left to find out is who is going to be the villain of Fantastic Four. And obviously a lot of people think it'll be Dr. Doom. Maybe it will be. And if it is, who's going to be our Dr. Doom? Like that's that's the big thing left. There's really nothing else left to be revealed. We know who the Fantastic Four are. We kind of know a little bit about the movie already. Um, so I don't know when, what's the release date for fantastic four. Ooh, let's see. Or did they move it to 2026 or is, is it still in 2025? I don't think it moved. Double check race. See what it is. 2025 still. Okay. So do we have a month? Uh, July, July, 26, right? Yeah. Of 2026. Oh, no, 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 no. It's 2025, July 25 of 2020. So normally mm. at CinemaCon. They talk about the movies that are coming out in the next 12 months. That means this Fantastic Four is outside of that. So I don't yeah. think they're going to mention anything at CinemaCon. Um, James Gunn said he won't be at Comic-Con, but that doesn't mean they won't have DC representation at Comic-Con. So maybe Comic-Con, I guess, but there's not much left to find out other than who's the villain and who's going to play the villain. That's really the only big thing left. All right, let one last one today. What's next? From Zelda Master, as a Disney shareholder, I have to say, I couldn't vote against this guy's picks uh, quicker. Thanks for the reminder. And remember, you can vote by mail, you can vote by phone, you can vote by email. Yeah. Nelson's probably going to do it by rotary phone or, or pigeon. Yeah. I, I mean, this this guy's just Thanks, a... Ray. He's just a tool. <laughs> he's a total tool. Don't and don't forget, it. he is Ike Perlmutter. Like, Ike Perlmutter and him are hand in hand. Like, don't forget that. It's him and Ike Perlmutter doing this together. Um, you know, I got to say, I question Ike Perlmutter's record. Yeah. <laughs> I question his, 
I just, can you say something more stupid than I question Kevin Feige's record? Like, if, if you just had to tell the room that you're the stupidest person there without saying you're the stupidest person there, I question Kevin Feige's record. Thank you. Bang on the money. Well done. Oh, someone questioned it? It must be a problem. <laughs> he, he might have his sights on Kevin Feige, just no matter what. Oh, no, listen, listen. Perlmutter. Yeah, has it? He wants, he wants to ruin Kevin Feige. It's just waiting, just waiting. Yeah, that's all it is. That that's that's what it is. Like, Peltz may have his sight sets on Bob Iger, but Perlmutter, he's got his scopes right on Kevin Feige. He's had it out for Kevin Feige uh, ever since they were working together. Once Kevin Feige went over his head and got out from under his authority, once they got Ike Perlmutter fired out of his job, Perlmutter has had it out for Feige. Hundred percent, he wants to bury Feige. No doubt about it. Um, anyway, at least as far as I can see. I mean, oh, yeah. just from what I'm looking at, that seems pretty clear to me. Maybe other people think differently. But guys, that'll do it for today's installment of the John Campy Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in questions, whether you use Super Chat or you're one of our beloved YouTube channel members. Because number one, you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported our channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the show Thank you guys so very much for your support. Don't forget to come on back and join us again tomorrow when I'll be flashing my $1.1 billion because it's take it to the bank guaranteed. I'm winning the California millions. Already started spending the money. I want to thank Ray Aura. Let's <laughs> see you tomorrow. Jonathan Voico. Later. The delightful Chris Carr. Bye. My name's John Campia. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.